in our general series of studies, we're in what's called the faith cycle. We've been taking all of these lessons out of Hebrews 11, the 11th chapter, the 40 verses in it. You'll recall in review that the writer took a group of believers that covered an enormous period of the Old Testament and broke them into four groups. He did the antediluvian period, four through seven, and then he did the patriarch period, eight through 22, and then he did a Jewish period, um, 38, um, 23 through 38, and then he did the Christian period, 39 through 40. Uh, what I've chose to do is each week after having studied a little bit, we're, we're looking, I, I went back and picked, I am picking or selecting one believer who exemplifies living the faith cycle according to the writer of Hebrews. And uh, last week we did Noah out of the antediluvian period, and this week we're doing Sarah out of the patriarch period. Uh, and she's mentioned in Hebrews 11, 11, by faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she considered him faithful who had promised. I want you to pay attention to two English words, the word even because it divides it into two ideas. Actually, in the Greek is the word kai, K-A-I, and uh, it's, it's often, most, most of the time it's translated and, but um, it's a conjunction. But um, they, they, uh, they did, they, they took liberty, which they could with the Greek language in this conjunction, and they translated even uh, and to kind of emphasize the point from which it came from, which was Genesis 17. It doesn't come technically from the Greek language, but rather uh, they took the word chi and a conjunction and translated even to make a point out of where, out of the actual story of Sarah, uh, her pregnancy when she was ninety. So, so here, th this is what we. I, I didn't realize I wrote it on your paper, but even Sarah herself received ability to conceive. That's one idea. That that would be like point one and point two even beyond the proper time of life or age. And then since she considered that conclusion to that, since she considered him faithful who had promised, and that's the faith cycle. When, when you get to, since she considered faithful who had promised, you're now, she's now waiting on him to perform what he's promised, ain't she, in the faith cycle. And, uh, the father, the father, by that I mean God, who is the sign off on the guy who signs off on everything in the scriptures, in my opinion, even though it's inspired by the Holy Spirit and human writers, he signs off on it. And uh, he certainly made a big deal out of Sarah and his a timing in her life for this to occur, which was the messianic seed. I mean, see, Sarah goes back to Genesis 3.15. You remember Genesis 3.15? She goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman will be at conflict with the seed of the devil. You know, the conflict. And uh, But sometimes we miss a, a kind of an important little phrase. Look at the second half of the word even where it says, uh, even beyond the proper time or appointed time. You know, the natural conception, child carrying, birth, rearing. 
uh, was not, that was not the schedule God had her on. He had her on the miracle scale, not on the natural scale. That's kind of interesting. On the natural scale, as a young woman, she was barren. And uh, then she, through, the, through natural creation order, she went into the menopause period area there. And now she was beyond able to, even if she was healthy and ready, she was unable now. And uh, that's when God appointed this in her life and our life. I mean, there's great lessons there for you and I. I mean, a lot of times in the natural order of life, things go just by natural order of life. And then sometimes they don't go at all according to the natural order of life. And that's when it requires great faith in it. Uh, or faith. Well, faith in the promises of God. And that's what, that's what Hebrews 11.11 11 is all about. Let's have a word of prayer. And we'll get into the lesson on the faith of Sarah. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be identified as mental attitude sins or sins of the tongue or revert sins. How do I, how do I, what do I have to do with them in order to get out of carnality back into spirituality? I have to confess them. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. That cleansing puts it, it's not a salvation issue, it's a spirituality issue. It puts you back into the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's very important for Bible study, John 14, 26. The Holy Spirit teaches and recalls the Word of God out of our soul. Puts it in, cycles it around, and now it's ready for application in our life by volition. It's a powerful idea. It's a supernatural idea. So, Father, we thank you tonight for these that come our way by the automobile and the Internet. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God regarding the faith of Sarah. Sarah, Abraham and Sarah. And we pick Sarah tonight because God picked her and put her among all the men. He, she put him and, and put a spotlight on her in Hebrews 11, 11, out of the patriarch period. And so we're going, we're going, we're going to look at that. Because what an interesting situation in her life. She goes from barren to menopausal to deep into her age. And then God does a miracle through her faith by grace. We thank you, Father, our Father, for that promise and that look into Sarah's life and to ours in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, Sarah's a great example of never give up hope especially when it's based on the promises of God. I mean, he promised her that she would have a, a messianic child, a boy. He promised to, that not just to Abraham, he promised to Abraham and Sarah and brings that back to the table in chapter 17. Well, tonight we're going to take a look under four ideas, four points on the faith of Sarah recorded in Hebrews 11, 11 based on the two evens by faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life or age, since she considered him, God, faithful who had promised. It's a marvelous thing. You know, if you really understand the marvelousness of this verse, you, you really have to study it out of the, you have, really have to look at the Hebrew text not necessarily in the Hebrew, but you have to look at the Old Testament story of how God dealt with her, and you need to read it a little more technically. It's just passive reading. Point number one, I want to recall your attention to the fact that the Hebrew biblical names often reflect prophetic messianic roles in the plan of God. You always want to, put, you always want to pay attention when God gives people names and they're major characters with God, you look, you look over, if you find them in Hebrews 11, then you want to pay attention to their names over when they got names or if their names were changed because they were a major player. They would have made a Hebrew 11 in the seat of Christ. 
And so that would be a clue for you to look. But Hebrew names, biblical names, often reflect some prophetic messianic uh, role in the plan of God. And it's true for Sarah. It's true for Sarah. It was true for Abraham, Sarah, and listen to me, even God. One of the things that people miss about the patriarch period is the number of times God changed his name. You know, people, they, they, uh, they like to talk about the different names of God in the Bible, Yahweh, Hiron, and things of this nature, right? Do you know that most of them come out of the patriarch period? I'm going to show you that today. Most of them come out of the patriarch period. And the other thing that people miss is what God is trying to tell them when he changes his name. When they're involved in some event in the plan of God and he changes the, his name, it's a personal deal for their benefit. That's often, sometimes people just like the idea that they memorize something, but you ought to pay attention to why, why it was so. And then start looking at what period of time these occurred. I'm going to show you a bunch of them today. Listen, God changed, changed Abraham's name from Abram to Abraham. He changed his name, uh, changed Sarah's name from Sarai to Sarah. And, he, and listen, in, in chapter 17 of Genesis, he changed his name from El to El Shaddai. Or El Shaddai. Changed his name. Now, his name is still God. <laughs> but he said, I want you to understand, I am El Shaddai. Translating the English, I am God Almighty. Now, why would he change his name? He changed their name and changed his in the event of the Messianic seed, Christ. I want you to really pay attention to that. For example, let's go to Genesis 17, where this story's picked up. This is Hebrews 11:11 11, 11 in the Old Testament. It's where the story comes. When you look at verse 1, now, when Abram was 99 years old, he's had, this, he's had the name Abram for 99 years. And now it's going to be changed. Very few people, unless they're reading the Bible, ever refer to Abraham as Abram. We always refer to him as, Sarah, as uh, Abraham and very few people refer to Sarah as Sarai because it would be improper, biblically, if you called him Abram, you would have to refer to his life before he turned 99. And if you called her Sarai, you would have to refer to her life before she turned 90 because God changed their name after that. He gave them the name and he changed it. Kind of interesting. Here it is. Here's verse 1. And when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai, or Shaddai, it's in a Y. I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, and he goes on into a conversation with him. God Almighty. If you have a study Bible, they've probably told you that's El Shaddai. E-L-C-H-A-D-D-Y. <laughs> that's the proper name. He's often, often given an I of the plurality. Okay? So God, God in this event... Abram fell on his face, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant, verse 4, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of multitude of nations. Because of that, you're going to be a father of a multitude of nations, and because of that, no longer will your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. 
I will make you a father of a multitude of nations. You got that? That's really important that you understand that. You see, his name originally was, was Exalted Father, and it has now been changed to the father of a multitude of nations. Agreed? We studied that in Genesis 14, 4, and 5. Now let me show you something important to this and why it's important to your life. Are you with me? I say that because I don't know if you are. Galatians, go to Galatians with me. I just want to show you one example of this, how it affects your life. This name change, how it affects your life because the prophecy of what went with it, right? There's a prophecy, okay? Look at the third chapter. It's a famous chapter about if you belong to Christ business. Uh, if, you, if you belong to Christ, there, you're neither a Jew nor a Gentile. You're neither slave or free, male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus down in verse 28. Verse 29. Now pay attention to verse 29 because we skip over it a lot of times. And if you belong to Christ, what well, says, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Abraham's offspring. This, this is what he's talking about. Now, what nation are you of? What nation do you belong to? Oh, thank you. This wasn't a trick question. I mean, everywhere in the world, when you become a, a person of Christ, you become a descendant of Abraham, seed. We're in the third chapter. We looked at 38, 39. Look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. Tie it all together. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. You know where that occurred? Genesis 17. This is where this is all progressing. Everything up to now where Abraham comes into existence in the scriptures in chapter 11 and, and is given the covenant in 12. That's when he was 75. Now, now he's 99. Verse 16. He does not say unto seeds as referring to many, but rather to one. He's talking about the seed of Christ is where the promise of Abraham is. And if you are in Christ, then you have fulfilled the Abrahamic covenant in Christ. You're part of the fulfillment. Christ said, I didn't come to, full, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. It's true with the promises, too. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, he does the same thing by, by chance. It, uh, not by chance, but I mean, in case you didn't know. Romans, the fourth chapter, he discusses this whole thing again. In Romans, the fourth chapter, 16 through 25, he talks about this same thing. He's going to say the same thing over again in, in regard to Abraham and Sarah giving birth to Isaac, the seed of Christ. That's the seed of Christ in the patriarch period. Abraham, Sarah gives birth to Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. That's a very big deal in Messianic history. Now, when you come to Sarai, Sarai's name originally meant argumentative argumentative and God is going to change her name to Sarah so let's go back to Genesis 17 we're going to look at 15 through 17 to see this idea then God said to Abraham as for Sarai in that Abraham listen God knows the difference between what he calls him when he first started the conversation he called him Abram now he refers to him as Abraham because he changed his name but he hasn't changed Sarai's yet, right? So he says to Abraham, Sarai. This is kind of interesting. God said, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah. And he tells him why. I will bless her. Indeed, I will give you a son by her, not Hagar or somebody else. 
then I will bless her, and she'll be, watch it, here's Sarah, here, here's Sarah, here's what Sarah is all about, and she shall be a mother of nations, and kings of people shall come from her. How about that? How about that? Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. Fell on his face and laughed. This guy's falling fall on his face a lot, Annie. This is one time you shouldn't have. <laughs> you don't fall on your face before God and laugh about what he's telling you. Like, ha, 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 One of those laughs, you know, like, <laughs> One of those laughs. That's not a good laugh. That's when my mother would reach down and get me. All right. El Shaddai became a very important word to the Israelites in Egypt. Come on, guys. We're studying that on Tuesday night, aren't we? Is that what we're studying on Tuesday? Who knows, right? Uh, do you know how long ago Tuesday was, Ron? <laughs> That's a long day, isn't it? That's been a long day and night. Listen, here's a wonderful read for you. Just the word El Shaddai, or El Shaddai, in the history of the patriarchs in Israel, 430 years total, right? You should read Genesis 17, what? Not now. 28, 3, 35, 11, 43, 14, 48, 3, and Exodus, the sixth chapter, verse 3. That name was dynamite to the patriarch people. El Shaddai. It was lights out. Point number two. And what does that mean? El Shaddai? God Almighty. It's a big name in your life, ain't it? God Almighty. God Almighty. Yeah. Point number two, the patriarch period was a time when God revealed himself to believers by important divine name changes. You can read about these in Genesis 12 through 17 and further. But for example, in Genesis 14, I'm talking about patriarch period. In Genesis 14, 18 through 19, he's El Elyon. He's the God of the most high God. This was when Abraham won the victorious battle over uh, Sodom and Gomorrah's group, that confederate of, of fighters, and, and had this great meeting with Melchizedek. That's where that name came from. Or in Genesis 16, 3, Elroy, God who sees all things, not Al things, but all things. Better put another Al, in, Al, Al another L in there. God who sees all things, this was with Hagar's meeting with God uh, when she ran away from home uh, and the angel of the Lord. Or in our passage, El Shaddai, God Almighty, regarding the messianic seed of Abraham and Sarah. Or in Genesis 21, 33, where he's called, he's called El Olam, everlasting God. This was when Abraham purchased the wells at Beersheba with Abimelech, and it became the, the, an important uh, piece of property or real estate for the patriarch burial. Genesis twenty two fourteen, 14, he's called the, you know, Haya Hirat, Lord will provide. You know where that occurred? Genesis 22, that's when Abraham took his son Isaac up on the mountain and was, was prepared to offer him a sacrifice. Yahweh, yeah, Yahweh, I forget what I said. Yahweh, Yahweh. Uh-huh. My point is this. See, all those names came out of the patriarch period and came out of enormous events of believers' lives where God revealed a divine name for a divine point, appointment in the plan of God that was essential, and he revealed himself in a different light to them so that they could get through the operation of whatever he had them engaged in. God still does that stuff with us. Here's my point. Our Abba Father, 
that's how we dearly address him. We address him as our Abba Father. Desires to have a personal relationship in the lives of believers today. That's what that name means. I'm your daddy, Father. It's exactly what it means. It talks about the relationship that God desires out of our life. That's our key. That's one of our key names for God. We spend most of our time, and rightly so, with the Lord Jesus Christ. The centerpiece of the plan of the church age. Now here's the third point. The introduction of God's name, El Shaddai, God Almighty, came when Sarah was 90 years of age and Abraham was 99, according to the scriptures. And they were given this message from God about their Messianic son. The message was that at the appointed time, Sarah would conceive and would give birth to a baby boy. You can read all of that in Genesis 17, 15 through 22. It's well worth your read. Both of them had a big laugh at that. They both had a big laugh at that. The big laugh was, how could two old people now have a son and raise him? She's, I mean, 90 in your age bracket. She's 90 in your age bracket. So just think about that for a moment and pass out. I mean, the fact of 99 gets me. Okay? They had a big laugh about it, as you might think, because they're thinking natural. Listen, when God gives you a promise, it's not, there's nothing natural about it. It's not the natural man that understands it. It's a spiritual man. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 3, 1. Third chapter, at least through verse 3, 2, 2.14 through 3.3. 3. The natural man, I mean, if, if you think natural on the promises of God, you'll, they'll never, you'll, never get, you'll never get down the highway with them. You'll never get completed. Because, listen, the, listen, well, look at the end of my point three. When did God teach them about El Shaddai, God Almighty? Did he do it before or after telling them they were going to conceive and give birth to a Messianic son at the age of 90 and 99? Before or after? Before. Yeah. It, he told them that in 17.1. Then he reveals what he's going to do about it in 15 through 21 or 22. And he's talking to Abraham. He says, I'm El Shaddai. And then he comes down to, down to Sarah and goes like, yeah. So he changed. He told him that and changed his name. Now he's going to tell Sarai and change her name. Now we're down 15 through 20, 17th chapter, but now we're down 15 through 22. When Abraham was told, he fell on his face laughing. Verse 17, seven, in chapter 17. Abraham suggested that God must be talking about Ishmael in the 17th chapter, verse 18. And God says, you, you got to quit that. <laughs> you got to quit doing that to me. I know exactly what I'm talking about, but you don't know it. <laughs> I am that confused about what I'm telling you. See, that's God's point to you. God's point to you. I'm not confused at all. When I tell you what I promise you, I'm not confused about what I promised you, even if you are. You need to get back on my page. I promise that I will do it. Circumstances have nothing to do with the promise of God being fulfilled in your life. Circumstances has nothing to do with it. That's the natural man. The spiritual man don't care. Drive forward. You, ha you, you have no idea how much time you spend in natural mind thinking about spiritual things. You got to quit doing that. You got to quit doing that. Listen, you got to remember, he is what? El Shaddai. He is God Almighty. If he's promised it, he can do it, Romans 4.21. When Sarah heard, down in 15 through whatever, when she heard, she had a good laugh. 
and did what she normally did as Sarah, became argumentative with the Lord in her inner dialogue. You can read about it in chapter 18, verse 12. She says to herself, after I've become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? What are the odds of that going to happen? We might as well be sleeping in separate bedrooms. <laughs> what are the odds of that happening? All right. And here's what he tells her. 1814. That's a good year, wasn't it? 1814. Yeah, right? A song breaks out when you hear it, doesn't it? Song breaks out. Listen to this, though. Here's El Shaddai. Here's the importance of El Shaddai. He reveals to her El Shaddai in chapter 17. Here it is 18. Listen, is anything too difficult for the Lord? Not El Shaddai, right? Not, not El Shaddai. At the appointed time, Ecclesiastes 3, God, God always has appointed times. It's you that's not on appointment time. God is always on time for his appointments. It's us that are always tardy. We're either early or late. You got to learn to be patient and, and, and be on time with him. At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year. And Sarah will have a son. How about that? Listen, God is so far ahead of your plans. At least a year. <laughs> right? At least a year. Now, he can't tell you that because you'd get crazy. If he told you what your life's going to be about this time next year, well, you'd go crazy. This is either the greatest Christmas or the worst. So God doesn't do that. He only tells you on the appointed time. But he does give promises. Then he keeps them. Whether you do or not, he keeps them. Sarah will have 18, 14. Point number four. When they left for the foreign mission field, Sarah was 66 and Abraham was 75. We know from our passage 90 and, 90, 90 and 99 that she was nine years younger. I mean, I can even get that math. So when he left, when you read chapter uh, 12, when he left the uh, when he left Haran, he was 75. That is, he was headed to the mission field at that point. She was barren. At 66, it's declared that she was barren. In chapter 19, she's now 90 and past menopause, and he's 99. Therefore, they've been on the mission field how many years? 24. Always check my math. Somewhere around 24 years. Right? They've been on the, and they've had this promise on the mission field that they have a child. This was their promise. It was one of many promises, but the seed, blessing, seed, and land, the three parts of the Abrahamic covenant. She is described in chapter 18 of Genesis, verse 11, as old, advanced in age, and past childbearing. That's the natural man thinking. But God says you're going to have one this time next year. You'll be, you, next year, you'll be 91, and he'll be 100. And I'll be back to see you. We'll be talking about kindergarten, preschool, all of that stuff. And then I'll have to listen to you whine about, well, you know, I'm old. Am I not going to live? Why would you give me a child? And I'm not able to live to see him grow up and be a grown man. Right? See, that's the natural man thinking. You got to quit that foolishness. He's not going to give you a child, not, not uh, the messianic seed, and not place the responsibility for training that child. We, we know it was. Abraham took him up as a grown young man uh, uh, in uh, chapter 22 to offer him a sacrifice. Wasn't a little kid. He was, he was a grown kid. Well, you can read about this attitude. She is described as old. That's a natural. She thinks natural. 
Maybe she shouldn't because she has her promise that says, think it's supernatural, and he gave her a name to go with it. What's the name? El Shaddai. You can say die or day. I say it backwards before her. I don't say it backwards. But. So let's go back to our text for a moment before I close. Hebrews 11, 11. Now, I just skinned over this wonderful story of chapters 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. I just, I don't like doing that with you, but we would have to guarantee breakfast for you. And we can't do that today. Marion's got to go to a funeral tomorrow. By faith, even Sarah herself received dunamis power. El Shaddai power. Power beyond her own measure, her own ability beyond her own ability, on her, or her own natural ability, <clears throat> over and beyond anything she could have thought or imagined at 90. Sarah herself received dunamis. <clears throat> Often in the New Testament, dunamis is connected with the power of the Holy Spirit. And the word conceived is made up of two ideas. The word Parabole is the idea of conception, and steros is the idea of seed. I don't think there's, I think, I don't know. I think there's, I don't think there's an I in that, but just in my head, it don't, it don't, that's the word seed, and I think that's like, well, anyhow, I don't know. Even beyond the proper time of life, which is the concept of age, the natural age, since she considered him, God, faithful, who had promised. Remember, he had given his name changed to her, to kind of like a guarantee. This will happen, Sarah. Do not doubt me. And he gave her the name about God. I want you to know there's a part of my life. You know I'm omnipotent. The essence of God. You know the essence of God. You know I'm omnipotent. I want to connect a personal word to you. I want to give you a personal word of guarantee to you. And I want you to remember this name because this is the name behind omnipotent power of God. It's El Shaddai. Mm. Ain't God wonderful? Ain't God wonderful? Now, how could we doubt him? I mean, he is so wonderful. And he, he listen, we live in a better situation than her. Do you know why? Because the third member of the Godhead lives inside our body every day, every moment. Right? We have that dunamis power living as a resident inside our body, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. That's dunamis power. That's the omnipotent El Shaddai living inside our body. We don't have an angel of the Lord come down and whisper in our ear and give us clues about this stuff. We've got the Holy Spirit that does it inside us. Oh, my goodness, people. You talk, you talk about being a bunch of spoiled people. <laughs> Has he not spoiled us as Christians? What a wonderful thing. That's what your heavenly father loves to do is just spoil you. When Mr. Jones was on his deathbed, he called me in. And he said, Ronnie, I got to leave my three girls with you. I said, yes, sir. He said, you got to take care of them, son. I said, yes, sir. And I thought he was going to say, put your hand under my thigh. And I went, no, nah, that's a, we're not going to go that Old Testament route. <laughs> right? But I was getting to feel the back, the back of my head was starting to sweat a little bit. And his, his final words to me was, and I've really spoiled him. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you, it's been an absolute privilege of mine to fulfill that old man's promise. It's been a 
It's been the joy of my life. It wasn't a burden. It wasn't one moment a burden for that wonderful man. <laughs> he said, I really spoiled him. And I went, oh, boy. <laughs> God's going to have to do a work in my life. <laughs> and, and isn't he always up to the task? And he did, and he has. And how wonderful God is. El Shaddai removed Sarah's barrenness at, at 90. And her age issues of conception at the age of 90. Because let me tell you, the omnipotence of God has a personal name for your life in the promises of God. El Shaddai. That's who, that's who the omnipotent God is personally to you, right? It's a personal name. You know, like Abba Father. It's a personal name. I'm never going to leave you nor forsake you. Why? Listen, I'm the father of fathers. I set the example. She believed that El Shaddai is God Almighty. She came to that final conclusion in her life, and life got a whole lot better for her, even at 90. This is a wonderful miracle of the reversing of the law of creation. Do you see that? What happened in her life was a reversal of the law of creation. That's a miracle. That is an absolute miracle. It's not as great a miracle as the conception of the Virgin Mary. But it's a good second. <laughs> it's not waking, it's walking. Without walking out the faith cycle, without walking, not waking. Without walking out the faith cycle in their lives, Abraham and Sarah would have missed this wonderful miracle by El Shaddai, wouldn't they? All of this happens by what? By faith. Faith permits from your life God to do miraculous things in your life. And he does it by grace. That's the marvelous part of this story. He does it by grace. He does it by grace. And so I put, you, you're familiar with the faith cycle, go clockwise on it. But when you read it and do it, Sarah's in your home study time, please pay attention to the directive will of God that's given to her in Genesis 17, 15 through 22. Because the faith cycle has got to work from hearing to believing to applying to completing. Often we miss Hebrews 4.2, the word heard. The word heard must profit you. When, and it will when it's united by faith in those who heard. In other words, Hebrews 4.2 says, Okay, Romans 10, 17, you've heard the word of God. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Hebrews 4, 2 says, yes, you must understand it, and then you must believe it. What you've heard must be united with your faith, believing. Once you understand what you heard and believe it, it becomes faith. Faith becomes the ability to apply it. Now you know what God desires. Now you apply it. You walk by faith, not by sight. It's not the natural. It's the supernatural. And then God completes it. James 2.22. Do you not see James writes about the offering? James 2.22 is about the offering of Isaac. The Abraham offering Isaac. He says, do you not see faith was working with his works? The exercise of his faith cycle. The exercise of it. Resulting in faith being completed? There's a word up there. There was a personal word that God gave him. When he said, don't sack it. Okay. Don't put the knife anywhere. Don't, don't put the knife to your kid. 
What did God say his name was? Yahweh? Yahweh. God, God will provide. And he gave him a personal name. He walked away there with a personal, a personal name that's connected to God with his faith. We will get those things at the judgment seat of Christ. These guys were getting them then. Praise and reward. And these names, when they, God gave them these personal touch names, these names became life-changing names for them in their personal life. Like, like Abba Father. That's how I address God. I address him as my Abba Father. That's how I think of him in my life. Well, in Genesis 21, 6, Sarah said, boy, by the time you get chapter 21, this is really important now. We, this all started in chapter 17 in Genesis. Now we're at 21. Listen to what she says. This is, this is looking back on El Shaddai and a marvelous, powerful God that serves, serves her by his will. Think about that. She said, God, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. Ah, uh, yeah, Isaac. Uh -huh. Yeah. But see, she wanted you to have a good spin on it. Not that cynical laughter, but rather that praise laughter. All right. Let's close in a word of prayer and we'll let the people on the internet off and then we'll have a short word of prayer here. Well, our Father, we're, we're so thankful that in our personal life, you're Abba. You're a daddy to us. Boy, how so sent your son to be point of connection with you no man can come to the father except through me and so god in his marvelous love put him on a cross so that we could come by grace through faith into a relationship with with you father where you're our abba you're our dad what a what a wonderful daddy you are i know i don't tell you enough i'll tell you enough tonight we're Reminded of Sarai becoming Sarah. And that personal name you gave her that just carried her every day in her pregnancy, worried about whether she'd go term and all these kind of things that naturally come. She would reflect, I'm okay. God has personally given me his name, El Shaddai. He's God Almighty. And I know for a year, he, she lived off from that name. And then always worried about the delivery. How would it go? Oh, I know it'll go well because of El Shaddai. And here in chapter 21, she's still praising you. Now she looks back on her life and she goes, how foolish was I to laugh at God when I should have been laughing with him? Oh, what a wonderful story, Father. We have that power resident inside our body in the person of the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, beats all of these names of God in every, every, in every aspect because we have the whole deal. And I'm so thankful for it. I pray our people would understand that, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.